Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's sure good to be able to look up here and see your happy, sunshiny faces. Uh, there's plenty of room for you to bring your friends and your family and uh, your neighbors and your in-laws, your outlaws, and whatever we can find. This morning is Memorial Day. I want to share something with you this morning that is all together different than what we had before. That in the 16th chapter of the book of Luke, Luke writes a, I don't know whether it's a parable or an actual event, about the rich man in Lazarus. And one of the things that is told to the rich man is he was in Hades, in torment in the flame, but his son remembered. Abraham told him to remember. I happen to believe, and you might disagree with me, that one of the things that separates us from the animal kingdom is that while we can see traces of remembrance within the animal kingdom, it's not like we have that is being created in the image of God. I think the idea of memory is one of the greatest blessings we have as human beings. We can think back, we can reason, we can understand, and as a result of that memory is going, I want to dwell on that idea of memory today. But first of all, I, I want to share with you something. I told Ruth this morning, that, and I told Debbie as well, that I, I thought this morning when I woke up and got out of bed that I was died and went to heaven. For the first time that I can remember for years, when I first got out of bed, I didn't have a pain in my body. It only lasted for a few seconds. But I was able to hop out of bed like I did when I was 35, 40 years of age. I didn't have any pain. Uh, I walked to the living room and got me a clean pair of uh, te uh, teds that I put on my feet. And uh, I didn't have a pain in my body. I have been going through therapy for about a month now. And I think it is doing good. And I'm praising God for that. It's a blessing. Let's go back to Memorial Day. Can you tell me what day of May was first celebrated as Memorial Day before it was changed to the fourth Monday of that month? Anybody know? Who said the 30th? Okay, I heard it from two different areas. That's why I said it. Said it. And Ruth, Ruth knew because I told her this morning, Ruth, you keep quiet. And, uh, when it was changed, I, I can remember a lot of people saying all that's going to do is make people think of what they're going to do over Memorial Day weekend, and they're going to forget about those men that lost their lives during war service. In fact, I think if memory serves me right, in the year in which it was changed, that was my sermon that I preached. That we cannot let this elongated weekend interfere with our giving honor and praise to the war dead. Can anybody tell me what year it was changed? 78. Pardon? 78. Seventy. You read it in the notes. Okay, I saw you look down. I saw you look down. Okay, it was 1970 that it has changed. Uh, and I can remember. I, I can't recall where I was preaching at the time. I think it was down uh, Graceland, but I'm not sure. That uh, we need to uh, keep our minds on the Lord. And when I preached in Thomasville, Pennsylvania. One of the leaders of the church, Ray Turk by name, was a young fellow, a very, very, 
responsible. I mean, he was uh, one of these well-educated guys that very humbly served the Lord. And, uh, he was uh, a couple of times he and I had difference of opinion, and he let me know what he felt. I let him know what I felt. And, uh, we were very, very close friends. Uh, as a result, uh, he was the chairman of the school board when. The idea of taking prayer out of school was uh, being emphasized in Pennsylvania. In Tottenville, Pennsylvania, it was one of the last school districts to have to remove the prayer from school because of Ray Turner. But Ray was very actively involved with the Veterans Society. And he was the one that chose to bring the Veterans Day or Memorial Day message in the downtown part of, of the uh, Townsville, Pennsylvania. And I can remember going down just out of respect for Ray. And Vera and I would stand there, we would take our kids with us. I don't think they would remember that because they were quite young at the time. That we would take them down and make them be there and listen to what Ray had to say. And Ray had a pet philosophy that we do an injustice. That not only honoring our war dead, men that died during the time of war, that we ought to add to that those individuals that were maimed, were wounded, they carry stress, post-combat distress, whatever that might be. We need to remember them that have lived a lifetime of misery as a result of being in time of war. I don't want this morning to neglect the idea of honoring the war dead. But I had difficulty. Because every time I sat down and started to put thoughts together concerning the moral day, I found that I was doing nothing but repeating what we showed in the videos during the past 13 plus weeks. And I thought David Barton did a marvelous job in presenting the idea of preserving our American heritage. And I didn't want to really take away from what he said in those videos in order to be able to justify my sermon today. One thing I did learn as I got involved with this was the difference between Veterans Day, which is in November, and Armed Force Day, which is in May, along with Memorial Day. Memorial Day is remember those that lost their lives. Veterans Day is remembering all veterans, regardless of whether they served during the time of war or not. And Armed Force Day is serving, uh, honoring those who are now serving our country in war. It was a difficult sermon. I jumped to the idea of maybe going down through the history of the Hawan Church, uh, mentioning some of the ones that I knew that uh, served the church well, which gave the greatness of the history of the church. And I thought of many that had passed on that uh, during my ministry, uh, Mike's mother, uh, Peggy Mays, some of the other ones. And I, I know that some of your relatives were very actively involved, but I'll be honest with you. I was afraid I would overlook somebody very important and I didn't want to offend even by my innocent omission of names. So I didn't do it. I, I, I thought about the idea of going down through the history of the church from the time of the first century, just mentioning some of the great warriors that lived down through the years and some of the accomplishments that they did. Again, I have to set it aside because it's too vast of a subject. And all during 
during the time that I was thinking about my message this morning, one thought kept going through my mind over and over and over again. And that thought was very simple. Remembrance of the good, remembrance of the bad, remembrance of the ugly and the beautiful of the things that we experience in our life and how we deal with that today. I am thinking that uh, this thought just popped in my mind and uh, I, I hope I am right, but I think First Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, uh, somebody might want to quickly look that up that uh, Paul, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, makes that statement that whatever happens to us is common to all. Common to all. When I preached down in uh, Corbin, Kentucky, the church down there went through a period of tragedies. I don't know whether Ruth was in college at the time or, uh, or what, I don't know. Well, I had one young man, 13 years of age, that was hiking a trail along Cumberland River and Cumberland Lake. And there was a great ravine that was there. And he fell off that ravine to his death. I spent a lot of time with the family during that particular time because of the tragedy. And to this day, I don't think they know whether he was pushed and murdered, whether he committed suicide, or it was accidental. It was a little bit later on that, that during that particular time, we had a young man associated with the church that was out peddling some things for school in order to be able to raise money for a class project. And as he was walking down the road carrying a box of candy, I think he was selling candy, a car could not negotiate the turn. It's going too fast. It crushed him against the stone wall. And along with that, we had several other tragedies. We were shaking our head, she remembers those signs. It was during that time that I was inspired to write a series of lectures and present them at the church on a Sunday night on if God loves me, why do I have so many problems? And I'm sure that many of you can ask that same question. If God loves me, why do I have the problems that I do? I think the second lecture that I had there was a series of six lectures that I gave. The second one was the idea that we are not exclusive as good people of problems. Problems don't happen to good people only. People that are the world suffer as many problems as we do. We need to remember that. And what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, if I am correct in that passage, that whatever happens is common to all. That God is faithful, he will with the temptation furnish a way of escape. I, I, I think we need to remember the idea that we all, every one of us, have experienced things in our life that are unpleasant. I was at therapy the other day. One of the therapists uh, told the story about somebody asked him one time if he uh, woke up in pain this morning. He said, no. He said, I'll let her sleep. But, uh, uh, really, I'm sorry. I can hear you shaking your head all the way up here. And, uh, 
We all have problems. If somebody tells me they don't have any problems, they're either stupid or lying. And I firmly believe it. So I, I want to use this God-given ability this morning to talk about this idea of our ability to remember. Since this is a day of remembrance, first of all, the past. Regardless of whether you want to think of it or not, we are the product of everything that has happened to us in the past. There is nothing that has happened that we have not been influenced one way or the other, either positively or negatively, in our lives. In February 1980, excuse me, 2012, 11, I'm sorry, 2011, I, I, I began my ministry with y'all. We've gone through a lot during that particular time since, since then. I have shared the problems, I've shared the joys with you during that particular time. But I'm not sure how many of you fully realized the circumstances of my life when I came. My wife had just passed away the December before. I was three months without her. December, January, most of February when I came. I could have been bitter, I may have been, about her loss. Steve and Ruth are sitting right here. We received a phone call on December the 5th from the hospital that they had moved my wife from skilled nursing to the main hospital. Steve was the first one that got ready and started to run. I had to call the neighbor of the church at God because I was preaching there at the time to make sure that they knew what was going on. This was at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And when Steve got there, he found out that she had been moved to the wrong floor by emphasis of Dr. George. Rather than sending her to intensive care where she needed to be, because she had a heart attack. And by the way, I was supposed to take her home that Monday, the next day. I did, but not the way I was told. And I, I can remember the bitterness that I had to the doctor. Why didn't he send her to intensive care at the beginning? And I often wonder, even to this day, if they had sent her to the proper floor where she did the proper treatment, if she may not still be alive even today. I cannot be that way. I did talk to the doctor. I, I, I asked him if he knew that several times before she was having this problem and they sent her to intensive care rather than to the main floor. And he said he did not. I finally, in order to be able to satisfy my own attitude, had to dismiss all this as human error. in order to be able to cope with the situation. I deeply appreciate the Holland Church of Christ. For without realizing it, their encouragement during this period of time was a blessing, was a blessing to me. And it helped me cope. 
I am today what I am because what I experienced during my wife's death. I am what I am today because what I've experienced down through my life, whether good or bad. And everything that I've experienced, if I had not turned it over to God and let God control, I would not be the person that I am today. And the only reason I'm saying this and making a personal confession is in the hopes that maybe my experience would be a benefit to you in coping with things that have happened in your life. Let's talk about the present. I want you not to look at your neighbor, your daughter, your mother, or your brother, your sister, or, or whoever may be here. I don't want you to leave this building, but I want you to look inwardly in your own life with all honesty and all objectiveness and ask yourself a question. Am I the person that I want to be today? I think we need to do that. By the way, when I did this during the past week, and I did it, I love it deep in the mother heart. I don't think there was ever a time that I, I'm the person that I want to be. I always want to be better than I am. Don't you? I'm sure you do. Am I the person I want to be? But more importantly, am I the person that God knows that I can be? I often wonder, and I asked Ruth, who was the one that wrote and sung first the song, Why Me, Lord? What have I ever done in the third section of one? If my memory serves me right, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that was Johnny Cash that did it. I don't see any pictures going up and down, but I think it was Johnny Cash. I often wonder, why me? Why me? And I am convinced that God sees in me something that I don't see. God sees in you something that you don't see in you. And I think the goal of our life is not to be what God, what we want to be, but what God wants us to be. And we need to be able to work with that. And the last is perspective. Notice that each one of these starts to get with a P. Just a couple of quick questions or quick, quick, quick thoughts. In Romans, the seventh chapter, Paul deals with the idea of the struggle that he experiences between good and bad. Is it the good that I don't want to do? The good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, I, I get that all the time. Uh, there, there are things that I do in my life that I quickly have to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I know I should have done that, but I did it anyway. Uh, sometimes we're like Red Skelton and when he played junior. If I do it, I get a whip. It. I do it anyway. I think we need to realize that there is a struggle. There is a struggle. Paul writes in the book of Hebrews, and I think he wrote the book of Hebrews, that in the 12th chapter, it says, uh, Therefore, being compassionate by what's said, a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is set before us, setting aside the sin that, that so easily beset us. Get rid of those things that weigh us down. Run the race looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith for the joy that was set before us. Endure the cross, despise the shame. Is that the right hand in front of God? We, we need to realize, we need to realize
realize that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We need to accept with entirely the idea that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. And in Romans 8, chapter 6, he concludes, I'm just going to read one verse, all this. And the verse that I want to read is the 37th verse today. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loves us. You are a conqueror over all things of life that throw at us. Life is hard. Life is difficult. When we put our lives in God's hands, we become conquerors. One of my favorite Old Testament passages, and this is not list here. Is Isaiah the sixth chapter. When Isaiah has the vision of the great throne of God and all the seraphim and all the glory and all everything that was being done, his comment was, I am undone. How would you feel if all of a sudden you were transported in your mind and saw God sitting on his throne? With the cherubims and the seraphims and the glory and the thunderous uh, things that were taking place. Then the question who will go and work today? Who will do this for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Here am I. With God at your side, with the task that is before us. We need to remember that the task that God has given to us as a congregation, the Hallelujah Church of Christ, the task before us is not as great as the power behind us. John writes in the fourth chapter of John, greater is he that's within us than he leads in the world. We need to get busy. Jesus is coming. Whether it's a hundred thousand years from now or just tomorrow, he's coming. And we need to be faithful in all that we do and all that we say. We're going to be singing our song of invitation just now. Just as I have one verse. If any here that needs to make a decision for Christ, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.